the real problem with skincare are the compounds and chemicals that they inject into these products to keep mold and bacteria from growing. If the first ingredient on your skincare product is water, it's not a skincare product. I noticed that my body odor changed significantly when I transitioned from clean paleo at large to pure carnivore. In the general pork industry, 98% of the pork in this country is raised in a house that never sees the sun, full of antibiotics and hormones, just horrid food and diet. I would not use that lard because, again, monogastric subcutaneous fat, I can't speak for the quality of that stuff. Is it better than a seed oil or is it better than former engine lubricant? Probably. All right. Wonderful. Charles, welcome. How are you today? <clears throat> Sean, I'm doing great. Great to see you. Yeah, good to have you here. So remind me, you're somewhere like what, Tennessee or somewhere? I can't remember exactly where you're from. Yeah, East East Tennessee. That's right. Okay. And you are, I like the pig behind you. So you are a proponent of the pig. You are a, a, a lover of lard, I suppose. So I guess we'll get into that. Charles, for those who don't know, just tell us, what do you do, Jim? What do you do these days? Yeah. So the day job is commercial insurance. I, I work most of, mostly in the food manufacturing production space. I like restaurants and places like White Oak Pastures. Everybody's got to have insurance. So that's the day job of applying my passion for food to that. But yeah, by night, I, I mix up batches of animal fat and squeeze them into a jar and ship them out to those that are willing to see how the Lord works in mysterious ways. That's about it. And it reminded that that's Faro, what do you call it? Faro Life or something? What was it? Yeah. The website is Faro, F A R R O W dot life. The word Faro is an, actually an homage to pigs, the first lard based. A lot of the animal fat based skincare companies that are out there are tallow based. And we can certainly talk about the differences. But, uh, but yeah, we're the first, first to use lard. And Faro, when we were coming up with the uh, figuring out the brand and all of that. Pharaoh refers to a, lit, a litter of piglets is called a pharaoh of piglets. And, and if you're a proprietor of getting mama pigs and daddy pigs together to make baby pigs, they call that pig pharaohing. So it has to do with the birth of pigs. And since we birthed a lard cream company, we figured it was appropriate. Okay. I was wondering where that came from. Awesome. Thanks for educating me on that. Hey, what, just before we get into the, maybe some of the nuances and difference between tallow and lard, and I've seen a lot of tallow based skincare companies that have popped up re in recent times, I, I think to coincide with the growth of this animal based nutrition style, historically, all these petroleum based skincare products that are out there that are of questionable I guess maybe even safety. Some people might have some concerns around that. What did people use for skincare historically going back hundreds and maybe even a thousand years ago? Is that known? It's, it's somewhat known, Sean. And I, I got to tell you, um, I, I came to you via social media, but I've been chowing through your book. It's fantastic. You actually touch on some of that. It, it, this is my hypothesis. I believe so. Historically, to your question, yes, oils have been used. Olive oils, you can look at some Egyptian texts and other retired civilizations. And we've always had an infatuation with skin health and skin care and skin vibrance. Ironically, and this is really where I think the rubber meets the road. Most people didn't really require a lot of skin care. Most of us until several hundred years ago, reason being, probably at least on a weekly basis, 90%, 95% of the world was elbow, were elbow deep in the visceral fat of an animal, probably on a weekly basis. You've got the agriculturalists out there, but if you were living out on the frontier or if you were anywhere, you were readily and oftentimes in contact, direct contact with both subcutaneous animal fat or the visceral fat just by default of harvesting an animal and turning it into food. And so I say that because at the turn of the century, these, these seed oils come along. It actually, the, all the Criscos and everything that we have in our diet today actually were born out of the cosmetic soap and candle industry. 
if you dig into the Procter & Gamble story at the turn of the century, yeah, cottonseed oil was originally a low-cost input for candles and soap, and then electricity and the light bulb come along, and they're like, what the hell are we going to do with all this cottonseed oil? Because our candle business is going to go the way the, of the dodo, and that's when they hydrogenated cottonseed oil and started marketing it as, uh, as the magic, awesome cooking fat. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's kind of an interesting history on how we eventually started eating these sort of industrial lubricants at some point. But what, as far as our skin is generally designed to keep stuff out for the most part, it's a barrier. If we have a cut in our skin, then we're more prone to get infection and other things like that. I've got this big old cut on my cheek. I don't know if you guys can see it from, I got scratched in jujitsu the other night. So I got this big old gas, or hopefully it'll heal up pretty quickly. But what, when we're sm sm smearing on all these products, whether they're animal based or petroleum-based products as much as the, like I said, as much of the skincare, the oil of Olay, and I don't even know what's in that stuff. I never really put any of that stuff on me. I'm a, I'm a guy. I don't really like worried about women more, tend to more than men for whatever reason, but eh, maybe in other cultures it's different. But how much of that stuff gets through our skin's barrier? Do you know? I don't know specifically. I, I will say much, although I would say not directly, but much like the semi-permeable nature of our small intestines, our skin does have a, it's a, it does eat things. It's called our second stomach. It's, it's our largest organ. And so the best example I can give you, Sean, is most people have had a, a brush with poison ivy, right? Which is an oil. It's the oil on the plant that gets on our skin and that it becomes irritating. Now, to the degree, and I, and I always like to have this conversation, our skin, our stomach. Okay. So our, what we put in our mouths. We've evolved with a very efficient emergency evacuation system, okay? Because, and you see this in food aversions during pregnancy for women, but it, oftentimes it's meat because thousands of years ago, rancid or infected meat was a surefire way to harm the fetus, right? And so we've got these evolutionary templates in place gastrointestinally to exit things stage left or right very quickly. Our skin, not so much. And quite frankly, that's part of the real problem I'm trying to address. If you look at in nature, what we could eat, and again, this is very, the, the correlations between the struggles and ilks in our dietary guidelines and industry and our skincare and dermatologist guidelines and industry are they overlap tremendously. And so what would our skin over thousands or hundreds of thousands of years evolve to do? Well, it senses heat very well. It senses acidity and things that aren't necessarily aligned with our pH. Then outside of that, it doesn't have much in terms of a diagnostic or a warning system to keep things away because in nature, there are just very few things, hot lava or really cold something else that that have a a real nasty short-term impact on our skin and so it it does eat things it does consume things and that's the biggest problem i'm trying to address with modern day skincare is it's not necessarily the fats although i we can all agree that petroleum derivatives and seed oils which constitute the vast majority of the fat side of ingredients in skincare skin industrial skincare is three primary ingredients it's water it's fat on the other end and some form of emulsifier in between. Now, there's all sorts of chemicals you have to introduce into that environment once you've created it. But those are the three big, big tenets of skincare. And so over here on the fat side of the house, I could make the argument that seed oil's bad for us. How much is getting through the skin? The real problem with skincare are the compounds and chemicals that they inject into these products to keep mold and bacteria from growing. When you combine fat with the water acts as a fuel source for the any and all bacteria airborne contact, that's the, excuse me, that's the fuel. And so you have to inject these chemicals. And we know now that those chemicals are highly endocrine disrupting. They kill our natural microbiota. We're covered in five to seven pounds of bugs in and on our skin and our gastrointestinal tract. Again, the preservatives in the food we eat is doing the same sort of disruptive pattern to our, to the bacteria in our, in our gut. And so I'm trying to get that stuff out of our skin diet. And the best way to do that is to get the water out. And then beyond that, use 
fats that are more closely aligned with human biology, and that would be pigs, ideally. And then obviously ruminant species, cows, bison, elk, deer, that, that fat works well also. Why is it that you're able to make a skincare product out of tallow, out of lard, out of the various animal fats? It's clearly doable and people have known how to do it presumably for a very long time. Why is it that we now have a petroleum-based market? What? Why is it just cost? Why is that like it is? Cost is a big driver. And then most of the, if you look into, uh, I was just doing a, a thread on this the other day, Neosporin. So Neosporin, I think is the globally the most popular topical antibiotic skin cream. It's made from a waste product. It's white petrachum. It's a petroleum derivative. If you work on a in an oil field or around gas or diesel being used all the time, this, it's this buildup stuff. And they discovered it, I want to say in the early 1900s, maybe late 1800s. But it's a byproduct, which I'm using a byproduct from raising and eating healthy, happy pigs and cows. It's the same byproduct. But if you look at the convergence of back to the Procter & Gamble story, so at the time they were trying to expand their soap enterprise and figure out how to, how to make up for the loss in candles, candle business, there was also a price fixing thing. And most of the pork fat and beef fat was in the at the turn of the century in the United States was handled out of Chicago. And there's this huge price fixing thing. And yeah, it's cheap. It's readily available. It's hyper shelf, shelf stable, if you want to call it that, because it's just this goop that sits around until you're ready to use it. Our products will spoil. But at some point, animal fat will go rancid. But the timeline on that is it's still a considerably long time. Yeah, I think it all boils down to cost. It certainly has nothing to do with consumer health or protection. Yeah, okay. And you'd mentioned the principal ingredients of most of skincare products, water, a form of fat of some sort, often a petroleum product. And then, of course, uh, emulsifiers, which allow the fat to mix with the water. It just breaks it into smaller particles so you can get a kind of a homogenous blend, if you will. Do I guess you don't? Do you require any emulsifiers for lard or anything like that? Is that needed or no? The the emulsifier is purely to bring water. Everybody knows water and fat don't mix, and so the emulsifiers are purely there to to be able to combine those products together. Okay. No, the answer is no. We don't use we don't use any water. A good rule of thumb I give everybody that asks is if the first ingredient on your skincare product is water, it, it's not a skincare product. Unfortunately, that eliminates like 99% of the market that's there. But uh, but yeah, if there's water in there, that water will feed bacteria. And so you have to inject these parabens and oxybenzones and various ph phthalates. And there's just an absolute ton of various compounds. And interestingly enough, Sean, when you do that, so these compounds all have different pHs. And one of the the, one of the magical keys to the castle of skincare is aligning the product ideally with skin, human skin pH, which we want basically neutral on our skin. And so a lot of times what these companies are doing when they make a product is they're trying to, well, you got to put this in there to keep the mold from growing. Okay. Now with the pH is it's too acidic. So we got to throw something else in there to make it more basic and get it more pH aligned. And so you get into this chemical cocktail making situation. And unfortunately, the consumer protection for skincare, the act was written in 1938. It's the Food and Cosmetics Act of 1938. And at the time, again, think back to how many petroleum derivatives and chemicals that we derived in 1938. At the time, the only ingredients in skincare cosmetics at large that required free market safety testing were color additives. And that was it. They've updated that act, Sean, twice since then. Cosmetics have been excluded both times. And part of the problem we have now is there's really not a lot of consumer protection. And you know this, there's a big difference between testing a product to not hurt you versus testing a product to help you. That's most of the cosmetic testing, and you see the labels, animal cruelty free, they didn't test it on animals. Great. But most of the testing now is to make sure it won't harm you, as opposed to thinking about its utility and helping. 
Yeah. You see a lot of claims made from these different products, so reverse aging or smooth out wrinkles or all the things that are there. And I, I'm fairly skeptical about all that stuff. And I think it's a lot of that has to do with just nourishing yourself appropriately and all the things that go into leading a healthy lifestyle. But why, I guess, why pig and as opposed to towel? Maybe you can talk about some of the differences. I know a lot of pigs are used in research, particularly with their GI tract, is very similar to human beings. A lot of people are accused of being pig, men or pigs or something. We hear that, but why Why not do towel? We, we use tallow in our products. So I, I use tallow, lard, and leaf lard. We can talk about those three. So for all your listeners, so we as mammals have two types predominantly two types of fat. We have subcutaneous fat, our belly fat, back fat, bacon fat, if you will, on a pig. And then we have visceral fat. We have a internal inside our organs that are designed to protect our predominantly our kidneys. It's called kidney fat. So tallow is a visceral fat from a ruminant animal. So that you've got beef tallow, bison, any ruminant species. Visceral means it's internal organ fat. Okay. And the beauty of tallow, again, we use some tallow in our products, is it's visceral fat from a ruminant species. So there's a lot of leeway in terms of, first of all, how, what is that animal eating, right? And how is, how is its lifestyle? You want to raise a healthy, happy animal. And then are you injecting it with anything, whether it's the beef industry or the dairy industry, all of that stuff? In other words, it's very difficult for poor environmental factors, whether that be diet, environment, or injectable or fed antibiotics and hormones, it's very difficult for those chemicals and compounds to manifest and get and get stored in the visceral fat. Now, it'll get stored all day in the subcutaneous fat, but we tallow is not from the subcutaneous fat of a cow. Most of the time, that fat is ground up and used to give you the fat presence in your ground beef, 90, 10, 80, 20, and so on. Pigs are a monogastric animal. Pigs are, you said it, they're so similar to us in terms of biology. We train our surgeons on pigs. We actually use pig parts. I know you talked to Dr. Phil Ovedia. He's a good buddy of mine, a heart surgeon. And I always joke with Phil, I'm like, how many hearts have you fixed with pig parts? And he's like, oh, I do it all the time. So the biology of pigs is this sounds Orwellian with Animal Farm, the book, but the biology of pigs is such a spot on match to humans that we train our finest surgeons in the land on them and use their parts in our body. And so that's a two sided coin, Sean. That means that if you raise, or more appropriately, you have to raise in an environment where you raise a healthy, happy pig that metabolizes vitamin D from the sun the exact same way and stores it the exact same way humans do. It's going to store all of those nutrients in its subcutaneous fat, okay, and what we render into lard. I mentioned leaf lard. We use that as well. Leaf lard is the pig equivalent to tallow. It's the rendered kidney fat, the visceral fat, from a monogastric omnivore versus a multi-chambered stomached herbivore. Okay. And then do you, Charles, do you raise pigs yourself or anything like that? Or how did you, I can't remember where you got, I think something like that, or what's the deal with you and the pigs? Uh, for my favorite farm animal, I, I, I was raising pigs myself. I was, I started, I moved back up to Tennessee in 2016 and started a sort of a micro animal production business. Mayfield Pastures was the name of it. We raised pastured beef, pork, chicken, eggs. We do a batch of turkeys every year. I would call it like a micro polyface. I'm sure you're familiar with polyface farms. It was a very, I've known Joel for years and he's one of my mentors. So yes, I was raising my own pigs up until raising my own animals up until this past December. It took about 12 months of day job, farm job and Pharaoh for me to throw in the towel on something. And fortunately for me, Sean, there are some fantastic local farmers around here that, again, you have to raise these animals properly for their fat to be of high quality. And so I've been able to find sources for my fat, for my ingredients that, that meet the standard I set for our products. 
Let me talk about, you'd mentioned when we test, I guess probably maybe it's FDA that does this testing on these skincare products. I'm guessing maybe not, but they're testing to see if they're harmful to us so they can put them on the market. If they're not harmful, hey, or not acutely harmful, they're on the market and people put them on there. But as far as being helpful, how can these things be helpful? And then maybe you can talk about some of the different reasons somebody might want to use a skincare product, whether it's dry skin or something like that. And then there's, I see there's always like different skin for the face versus the body versus the skin on the heels of the foot, the different formulation. What's the rationale behind that? And how can it be helpful for us? Sean, again, and again, this, there's so much correlation in between skincare and food. Okay. So I would, I would turn the same question to you when you go to the store. I know you're a carnivore. I've, I've been in that camp now for about six, eight months. Love it. It's, <laughs> how many marketing terms are on the box? It's the same kind of shtick. So with skincare, I, I don't know exactly what testing the FDA does for products outside of two scenarios. One is applying an SPF rating to a sunscreen. We can talk about that. In, in order to put an SPF rating on a product, it has to be tested by the FDA. Most of the other sort of top-down regulatory capture of the cosmetics industry at large is really around labeling and just making sure you've got all the ingredients on there, they're the where it was manufactured. There's some rules and regulations there. Candidly, I don't know exactly what testing outside of SPF. Now, if you had a bunch of people getting sick, or having a reaction, then I would say that the FDA has the capacity to jump in there. But again, similar to food testing, most of this stuff is being done internally at the manufacturer or proprietor of the product, whether that's Olay or Beauty Counter or any of these other cosmetic manufacturers. As it relates to, let me make sure I got, yeah, is it any good for us? (laughs) I think we have a real problem. I, I think that the skincare market at large, okay, so you had a question about steps or 17 steps or this cream for that or this cream for that. I don't buy into much of that. Now, the consumer buys into it. If we have a face food product and a skin food product, neck up, neck down, people don't understand the biology of the skin underneath your eye is the same biology as the skin on the end of your elbow. What you're talking about is a difference in, in, in wear and tear. We don't rest our lower eyelid on a tree branch, but we'll prop up against a tree or we don't tackle someone in a rugby match with our eyes. We tackle them with our bodies. And I have come to the consumer with a face product. People, I, one of the questions I get asked all the time is, how do I use the product? I'd say, start by putting it on before you go to bed. Put it on at night. What about in the morning? If you get up and you want to put some more cream on, put it on. We've got 17 steps and we've got morning routine, night routine. We can talk more about the fact that we've got all these highly abrasive soaps and cleaners now. So we're effectively stripping all the natural oils off our skin on a daily or sometimes twice a day basis. And then we wonder why our skin's dry and why it itches and scratches. And so I tell people, it's another big piece of advice I give people is don't soak so much. Don't shampoo so much. Just hop in the shower, get you a washcloth, wipe off, and you're good to go. Yeah. It's, you think about all the unique sort of skincare products you have to include the oils and cr- the creams and oils. And then you've got the shampoos and the soaps and you've got the deodorants and things like that. It's quite a bit. Can animal products be used for all of those types of things that are tallow-based or lard-based and deodorants or antiperspirants and soaps and shampoos that you can use as well? The short answer is yes. The even short, the obvious answer is 130 years ago, everything was made with animal fat in the cosmetic industry. This, a lot of the ilks that we do encounter through with our skin specifically or how we smell and all these things. A lot of that's driven by our diet. And one of the things I know you point out in your book, and I was a paleo guy for years, That that's sort of part of my origin story in terms of how Pharaoh arrived. You clean up your diet and you're amazed at I don't stink as bad anymore or my skin doesn't get dry or I, I've got an autoimmune condition. And all of a sudden that 
that eczema that I've dealt with, or that psoriasis that I've dealt with for years, which was a symptomatic response to a poor diet, it's all of a sudden not so bad. And yeah, I hope that answers your question. I can get going and lose my place. Yeah. Speaking of things like eczema, psoriasis, and things like that, is it something that you would apply these products to? Because, you know, what, as you've mentioned, I've seen a lot of people put those particular conditions into remission, these autoimmune conditions through consuming animal fats, included in, in animal protein, of course. And I'm just wondering, you said our skin eats this stuff anyway. Do you think there's any benefit to doing that? Have you got any testimonials of stuff where people put this product on and said, wow, this has really helped with X, Y, or Z condition over the years? Yeah, Sean, I get, man, it's one of the things that gets me out of bed in the morning. Yes. The short answer is yes. I hear you've got two sides to the skin issue. You've got the acute side, sunburn, razor burn, mosquito bites, poison ivy, all that. And then you've got the chronic side, this, again, symptomatic rash or whatever that comes from eczema, psoriasis, chelitis, the various things. Yes. The short answer is I hear from people all the time. Now, can I make any claims whatsoever about my products? My dog's here. So if you see him flashing in the screen, I apologize. Go on. Go place. But yeah, I so, okay, T take eczema as an example. I, if someone asks me, does it help with eczema? My first answer is absolutely. I believe that it does. I have no double blind placebo clinical trial to tell you that, but here's what I can promise you. There's nothing in my product that's going to hurt or irritate your skin. And again, back to think about the steroid creams. Think about the dermatologist recommended stuff. It is an emulsification of water. If you're lucky, a decent fat, but probably not. And then all these chemicals and compounds that keep mold and bacteria from growing. And so at the very least, our product is not going to hurt your skin or dry your skin out anymore. It has been shown to be highly effective on, on soothing and helping with these conditions. I haven't had razor burn in three years. No one's been testing lard longer than me. And for a guy that would get chronic just right up around the Adam's apple and just some of these more prone to razor burn areas. It's a thing of the past for me. And here's an acute common skin condition that is completely remedied. When you first got the idea that I, I guess where, how did you get the idea to do this in the first place? You say, Oh, I'm going to make skincare products out of lard. What was the inspiration <laughs> for that? I, again, funny story. I had what I would say is the most common acute skin condition. I had an absolutely horrid sunburn. It was July 5th, 2019. I will never forget it. Again, I'm farming. I've got this paleo background. I've co-authored a number of cookbooks in the space. And so I happen to have a jar of rendered lard in my refrigerator that I was using to cook with. And which, by the way, every now and then you ought to, you ought to pan fry a, one of those ribeyes of yours in some lard. I'd love to see that. But yeah, so I, it was an act of desperation. I came home, medicine cabinets empty. It's late. I'm in a small town. All the pharmacies are closed. And I had this sort of epiphany growing up. If I got sunburned, my mom always kept this jar of aloe vera in the refrigerator to keep it cool. And yeah, I just had one of these moments. And Sean, I, I don't, this is not hyperbole. This was almost like a second degree burn. It was just absolutely, you're just lobster red, right? And so in an act of desperation, I cover my body in rendered lard and it soaked in. It was almost shocking how quickly my skin absorbed it, which I thought was pretty cool. Take a shower, go to bed, wake up the next morning. Put it on again. So two applications of this magic fat. And so about two days went by and my sunburn was gone. And so that's cool. You know this from your own experimentation and carnivore and even your exploits prior to that. I had learned this similar story through my paleo and Whole30 and that whole nutritional. When something like that happens, you really start to pay attention. And so for three weeks, Sean... I meticulously watched my skin on the shoulders, arms, everywhere, right? And I never peeled, not one stitch of skin on my body ever peeled. And that was the light bulb moment because again, for anyone of your listeners, you included that's ever had a sunburn, you always peel. Yeah, fair enough. And so 
you get, so as far as like, I'm going to start a business selling skincare products, there has to be some sort of testing and figuring out the right formula and yep. all this. So how did that go? Was it, was there a lot of just mass experimentation and how did that work for you? A ton of it. Yeah. I love that question. So this was January or July of 2019. I probably spent six months just tinkering in the kitchen, playing, playing with formulas. Actually the first two or three months, I mentioned this emulsification of fat and, and water. Oh my gosh, this is amazing. You go to Google DIY skin creams. And of course, they tell you get distilled water. And I was using beeswax and I made these luscious early creams that were just to die for lard, <laughs> beeswax and water. The problem was in about six to maybe 10 days, if I was lucky, they'd be they would turn black and go rancid. And then I start dumping all the antimicrobial essential oils in and still rancid at maybe two weeks, I could keep it from going bad. And so at some point I was like, I got to get rid of the water. And so got rid of the water. That's when I brought some tallow in for your listeners that don't know tallow and lard have different viscosities at room temperature. If you've ever had a tallow balm, it's like a balm. It's really hard. You can't just dig your finger into it. Uh, lard at room temperature is quite creamy. In fact, it can liquefy pretty quickly. And so a lot of the experimentation. So that was the remainder of 2019 and into 2020. And a lot of things happened in the world in early 2020 that necessitated thinking outside the box. And I had this little farm business and demand went up, but I couldn't get in to see butchers. And I had started making some samples of this stuff and just Again, I'd go to Atlanta to drop food off. And so I'd take people a little jar of this stuff and, hey, try this, try it. And I got tremendous feedback. And one of my dear friends and a, and a big supporter of the farm, we were on the phone and, and uh, he's, how's it going? I said, it's going okay. I can't get into the butcher. I'm running into all sorts of issues. It was just me managing managing that as well. And he's, man, that's skin cream. You, you need to do something with that because I think it's amazing. And so started making more batches and testing out scents and we have an unscented and a scented product. And uh, yeah, that's fast forward to, we launched in January of 2022 to the public and uh, yeah, just experimenting, playing in the kitchen, sending samples out. Good Lord. I sent samples, probably a thousand samples. I've got cousins in Alaska and they tried it and somebody, a friend of mine from college in Hawaii, it's, Pharaoh's been all over the planet in its early development phases. And so here we are. You mentioned unscented and scented. Now, Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, but lard generally, and probably pet tallow too, is pretty much odorless, tasteless. It doesn't really have a scent or smell for the most part. It's pretty, pretty neutral. Is that fair to say or no? I think that's fair to say. I would actually even say that I believe tallow to have a little bit more of an animal fat aroma to it than lard. People confuse bacon drippings with lard. And it's a fair con point of confusion. Bacon drippings are the rendered fat <laughs> cooked in belly meat. Uh, and so it's obviously got and cured and salted. And a lot of people joke with me that I'm smearing bacon grease on my face, which I guess technically I probably am. But, uh, but no, I believe the scents are, the natural scents are very neutral. Funny story, Sean. I started off thinking that we would sell way more of our scented product. In fact, when I ordered the labels for our first run, I think I ordered a couple hundred unscented labels and like several thousand scented labels because my head was like, people aren't going to want to smell this stuff. And the actual opposite has turned out to be true. And personally, I started with the scented product. I still enjoy it. But the all natural, really, it's almost like grounding. They say you put your feet on the, on, on the bare earth to ground. That natural scent now is way more attractive to me, uh, from a nose standpoint. Now you'd mentioned the problem with rancidity occurring at some point. How long does it, how long is this stuff shelf stable? Your product right now? Have you tested it to see this stuff will sit on your shelf for a year and you're good? Or is there a use by date? Great question. I tell people six months. Now I have early tests of products that I manufactured that, that were 18 to 24 months in still in the container and you open it up and they were perfectly fine. The reason I tell people six months is in, in our scented products, we use nothing but all natural essential oils and they diffuse. 
over time, just like your diffuser in your house. If you've got an essential oil diffuser, they will. So if you buy my product, we make our products fresh. Manufacturing happens up the stairs and shipping and packing happens down the stairs. I'm here at my home office now. So we make everything rel- relatively fresh. You order it today, you might not get it till next week, but we do them in small batches. But yeah, Sean, I've got products. I still have them that, that were made three years ago and I haven't opened them in a while. The fat, the active ingredient, if you want to use a skincare term, the active ingredient is good for a long time. Yeah, I hear about things like pemmican, which obviously is ground up meat plus the tallow, basically. And it, it's been known to be still edible but 20 years later. It's just, there's some level of the stability in there. I imagine temperature plays a role in this, keeping it out of the hot sun and things like that. And it would be helpful in that. How many, so how many products do you have right now? Is there just a two? Two skin creams on Senate and Senate, or I know you were when I'm because we we met each other at, at was it KetoCon this year? I think it was, yeah, in Austin. Correct. And we had dinner dinner together, and everything was really nice. But you were demonstrating some new thing. I can remember what it was like a new product, maybe Ep- Epic Dermis. Oh, so that's right. <laughs> so we have four products. We have a skin food and a face food. We have a we have an oral sublingual CBD elixir, and we actually combine those into what we call our total skincare bundle. We can talk about the CBD, but it goes, it's an oral sublingual elixir, helps your skin, supports your skin from the inside out. And then, yes, earlier this year in Austin, Texas, we launched our Epic Dermis product, way more lard heavy, less tallow, no leaf lard. And... I, I launched in the skincare space with a high-end model. So our flagship products, this bundle or the separated products, are come in these beautiful glass jars. They, I think it's beautiful and fantastic. And it has that luxurious kitchen countertop, bathroom countertop, skincare look. The problem is glass jars don't travel as well in purses or backpacks or on airplanes and your gym bag or whatever the case may be. And almost immediately after launching in 2022, I had a number of people clamoring for, this is great, but I'd like a portable packable product. And so we launched Epic Dermis. It's got a completely different scent profile. It's, this is what I, I've told the story of you trying it because you're a fairly large man, Sean, and you're standing in front of our booth lathering up with Epic Dermis. And it's got a formidable scent. It's very earthy. And, uh, and I think outdoorsy is basil and this, that, and the other bergamot. And your first, you're like, this is a masculine scent, isn't it? And I was like, yes, Sean, it is a masculine scent. Uh, Cause you, you get into skincare and it's, this is for the girls and this is for the guys. And I'm like, this is for human skin. And, uh, and so I, I love our new scent. It's a one ounce tube. It's aluminum, portable, packable. And so, yeah, we launched that in, at, in Austin at KetoCon and we're thrilled to share it with you. Yeah. And as far as if someone were interested in acquiring some of this, are you shipping to all the U.S.? Are you international or where do you guys ship to? We sh- we ship internationally. But yes, 99% of our orders are the contiguous U.S. I've sh- Like I said, I've shipped to Hawaii and to certainly shipped to Alaska. But yes, my, I would say we, I mean, we, I've shipped to Uganda. I've shipped to Brazil. So we if our country, if your country of origin is not, does not pull up on our website, then you just send me an email and I create another shipping. We do charge for international shipping, obviously, but we don't charge for domestic shipping. So yeah, any, anywhere in the, in the good old US of A, it's free shipping and usually there within two or two days. Yeah, I'm aware of at least several companies in the tallow business now. And some of them sent me their products and things like that, but I'm not really, I don't know of too many lard based companies are you guys fairly unique in that are there a few other out there or i'm not aware of any there was an etsy site or two that i ran across a couple years ago i tell people it's our hyper niche we say the lard works in mysterious ways and i do i sincerely mean that because of the biological symmetry between humans and pigs again you got to raise a pig in a healthy happy one bad day situation. You've got a lot of room over here with tallow and a ruminant animal, just again, by nature of how they metabolize energy, where they store it, and the fact that it's visceral fat. Love tallow. We use it in our products, 
But, but yeah, the Lord works in mysterious ways. So I think we're the only game in town right now. And until we're knocking on the door of some of these big skincare conglomerates and knocking into their bottom lines, I don't think we'll have too many imitators. What we mentioned that there's all kinds of potential uses for this product. Are you guys like thinking in the back of your mind, I'm going to cook up some other product, maybe a deodorant or any of those types of things? Do you think you got any things planning down the road? Doing it right now. Here we go. This will be fun. I can be quick. I'll ship you one. Okay. I'm testing out a deodorant right now. And these are the mock tubes that I ordered. Actually, the second thing I ever made with lard outside of cream was a bath bomb. I don't offer those right now, but I'd love to introduce those. I think the sky's the limit, to tell you the truth, Sean. And if you want to talk about my joy, my personal joy, is in the kitchen, like tinkering with this stuff. I've got my kids along for the ride. My, my daughter loves to help me with the making and experimenting lip glosses, lip balms, things of that nature. And my son loves the fulfillment side of playing with boxes and packing things up. And so it's quite the family affair. But yes, the short answer is I would absolutely love, I'd love for two things to happen. One, I would love at some point for it to be harder for me to get the requisite ingredients I need uh, because there is a much greater demand for animal fat, both from a culinary standpoint and also skincare standpoint. Good Lord, the textile uses of tallow lard are immense. And so long for that day. And then I long for an entire lard based section in the air quote grocery store or, or pharmacy, even though I tell people to stay out of pharmacies because if it's sitting on a shelf for 12 months, that means it's sat in a warehouse during the 12 months. And it means it's got chemicals in there that kill your microbiome and disrupt your endocrine system and, and hurt your skin. So, yeah, it's like, particularly for say like deodorant, I think there's specific ingredients they use, maybe aluminum, alum, I think aluminum oxide or something like that, that they sometimes mm -hmm. put in there, titanium dioxide for skin, for blocking out the sun and stuff like that. They have an advantage. They use those products because they work for whatever they do, although they have clearly have potential downsides. How do you get around some of that? How would a lard-based deodorant work? Is there something in there that, I guess, acts as an antiperspirant or, or as a microbial inhibitor, perhaps? It's not a microbial inhibitor. We use baking soda, one of the oldest standing. We use a little baking soda. We use some arrowroot powder. You use a little beeswax, the lard, and then obviously you go heavy on a on an essential oil. I think I do think it's important for a deodorant to have a scent. Not that it's masking so much as it's just emitting. And yeah, you'd be amazed what you can do with a little baking soda. Lord, you take the box, you tear it open, you stick it in your refrigerator, and it absorbs all the scent. This, I have found, especially even since going carnivore, I was a paleo guy prior to, which again, I think is a fantastic template to, for people to tinker around with. But I noticed that my body odor changed significantly when I transitioned from paleo at large, clean paleo at large to uh, pure carnivore. Now, after, after a heavy weightlifting session or a, an airdyne torture session, do I stink? Yeah, a little bit, but that's when you go take a shower and wash off and we're back to normal. Yeah. I'm going to, shortly after this, I got my own, I've got my own session. I got to do, I'm going to do the exact same thing, do a little exercise, but where, you know, I said you've got these products in development. Are you getting a lot of requests for certain things? Are you, is that what's driving the, the, the or is it just your desire to be creative or are people say, are people asking for, Hey, can you make this or that type of product? Yes. The answer is yes. I, First of all, I have my own skincare routine, right? I know I wear deodorant. I wash my hair. I, there's things that I, so selfishly, and I have children, they have their skin care routine. So I'm looking around, what holes can we patch or where, what voids can we fill in the cosmetic and skincare industry at large? You mentioned there's other players in the space. I don't know the first damn thing about makeup. I do know that a lot of makeup is, again, this is a predominantly female driven product line, but uh, I don't know that much about makeup, but you've got a company like Toops & Co. down in Fairhope, Alabama that has an entire really clean makeup line. So I love, I would love to continue to build out what we offer. And then also, again, continue to preach the 
if your skincare company or if your dermatologist isn't talking to you about what you're eating and your activity levels and your hydration, if they're not talking, then they're not doing their job. And so do our products work and help? Absolutely. Do they work even better when you're addressing some of these underlying dietary uh, problems when it comes to skin health? Absolutely. And so that's part of it. But yeah, definitely want to bring more products to a market. Yeah, you mentioned you, you, you long for the day when you said you have poor access to the essential ingredients, which means that there's probably a lot of lard is going to waste. Or is that the case? Because I know like within, in the cattle industry, they throw away a lot of hides, which could otherwise be turned into leather and other things. And is this a resource that we're just wasting? Yes and no. I would say that, again, back to the sort of you have to separate tallow, multigastric ruminant from lard, monogastric omnivore. I would say that by and large in this country, we are not wasting a tremendous amount of pastured pig fat. You go to polyface farms, you go to white oak pastures, you go to perennial pastures out on the West Coast. Some of the places you're getting some of your beef from, if they're growing pork, I would say that they've probably found a way to utilize that fat. In the general pork industry, 98% of the pork in this country is raised in a house that never sees the sun, full of antibiotics and hormones, just horrid food and diet. I would not use that lard because again, monogastric subcutaneous fat, I, I can't speak for the quality of that stuff. Is it better than a seed oil or is it better than a <laughs> former engine lubricant? Probably. But yes, Sean, I long for the day when the the supply side of pastured raised animal fat is higher and higher, but also the consumer demand and the consumer products that are made right here in our country, local ingredients, you, better utilization. Again, you mentioned the hides as well. It's just it's incredibly frustrating that uh, that we have these resources that just go completely to waste. And so that's one of the reasons I'm excited about our company and what we're doing. Obviously, you know, your company versus, I don't know, one of these giant companies that makes skincare, which is probably owned by some other giant company. They've got tremendous resource. They capture the market. They do all the advertising. Are there any sort of hurdles in your way let, let, to, to prevent that heat to consumer demand? Because it's, there's no reason that I can think of why this would be a product that many millions of people would want to use, except for the fact that it's hard to it's hard to get the market access because some of these other big players monopolize that. Do you see anything changing in that regard? Is it just gonna have to be grassroots, word of mouth, nose to the grindstone type of campaign? I tell people all the time that our company, I can only speak for Pharaoh, is gonna grow one shin handshake at a time. And I go to the keto cons, I go to the Western A prices. We're direct to consumer. And, and that's an obvious question you get from this entrepreneur community is when are you going to get in brick and mortar stores? And it's maybe never because I've got a, I've got this short shelf life, six months, and uh, I would rather consumers come directly to me. And this is not a vegan product. Okay. So the algorithms hate me. I'm sure you've been through this plenty of times with your. With the carnivore thing, the algorithms don't like anything that upsets the apple cart. A big pharma and big food are the same conglomerate. I think two or three of the world's largest skincare brands are certainly in the United States of America. Procter and Gamble owns a ton of skincare companies. Olay is one of the one of the biggest in the world. But yeah, it's an absolute uphill battle. But hey, I've said this from day one, Sean, and this is what I go to bed at. Our stuff works. It works unbelievably well. It's not conventionally similar in texture. It's It doesn't show up. You're not going to see an ad for mine in People magazine, you know, it, but it works. And it's worked from the first time I lathered it on myself. And I, not a week goes by where I don't run across some other skin thing that it's been helpful for. And the six-year-old girl with eczema all over herself in Knoxville, Tennessee, gone three days with our product and it's absolutely gone i can ride that positive momentum for a long time and i can tell you her mother tells friends and so yeah we're grassroots through and uh, and the lard does work in mysterious ways we will lard willing 
we will continue to thrive and spread the message. Yeah, you'd mentioned that upstairs is where you're creating up in the kitchen and downstairs in the basement, you're out there packing and everything up or something along those lines. What what level of increase would it, let me ask you this, because you seem very enthusiastic this. If the, Let's say the business were to 10X, 50X, 100X to where this is just a full-time job now. Is that yep. be something you'd be want? would you trade out the day job for just doing this full-time? And, and, and at what point would you have to move out of the house to a real mm. production facility? Great question. I do rent the commercial kitchen at my local church. So <laughs> we do have a little bit more space. But yeah, early on, I, we could go... Let's see, current volume. We could go about 20 to 30x our current pull through demand and stay comfortably right here in, in the house and shared space at the church kitchen. Now, I might be at the church kitchen a little bit more than now, but I'd say the thing that's concerned me from the very beginning has been the supply side of ingredients because, I, again, I'm not raising all the animals anymore. And I've got a handshake deal with my suppliers. We could run up to about 6,000 orders across all of our product lines. So 6,000 per SKU. We could run up to about 6,000 orders a month from an ingredient standpoint. And I, my background is logistics and operations. And so I know we can handle it from a manufacturing standpoint. The, the concern's always been the ingredient side of the house. And again, at 6,000 at 6, units a month, we're staffed up pretty solid, probably have our own standalone facility. Forget the commercial kitchen at the church. Sean, it's, it's one of the beauties about this. This is just scaled up cooking, cooking in your kitchen. We can scale remarkably high and put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears people to work. And it's not, it, it, this is high, this is high integrity work. It's not high skill work. It's high culture integrity, care. And so we could put some people that that want to get to work, we could put them to work. But yeah, I, I long for the situation where that you've presented, where we're moving out of here and move, moving on up. I wish you well in that, Charles. And just, I guess we're about finished up here with time commitments, but remind us again, where do we find these products? Feral.light. What is it? Remind me of the website again. Yeah, sure. It's Faro, F-A-R-R-O-W dot life is our website. And for your listeners, first order, the code F-I-R-S-T, first order, O-R-D-E-R, will save you 15% on your first order. I see a uh, note in the chat there. So yeah, Faro dot life is the website. And uh, yeah, you order it there. And we ship it from right here in, in East Tennessee. So, yeah. Sean, it's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, and you guys are you guys have stuff in stock right now? You good to go? Can you yep. ship stuff? Yep, okay. we're, we're stocked up right now. You know, who knows what'll happen after this interview? I'm incredibly grateful for sharing this time with you, and certainly really enjoyed meeting you in person in Austin. And hope hope we can get together again soon. I, yeah, I, I'm uh, sure. I'm sure we'll, we'll, our paths will cross again, Charles. Thank you so much, and thanks for what you're doing and the passion you display here. I'm sure it won't go unnoticed, and I hope people will be willing to try it for those of people that are into skincare products. And I will try to endeavor to be more <laughs> diligent about that. Uh, something I just don't think about that much, but thanks a bunch. All right. For the rest of you guys, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Charles. Appreciate it. Thank you, Charles.